So this morning we'll be in Matthew chapter 13, looking at verses 44 through 46. Originally I was going to finish up all the parables, but as I was studying, these two parables just fit together so so, so accurately that I, I just had to uh, look at these two parables this morning. And the theme is two people loved, two people loved. Um, if you don't know this, we do live in a world that basically has two people. Uh, contrary to what our culture will tell us, that we are uh, a diversity of different cultures and nations, uh, there really are in the eyes of God two people, and that is the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jewish people who were chosen by him and the Gentiles who who God had assigned Paul to go out and reach the world. And, and then within the Gentiles, you have a multitude of cultures and nations and so forth. But basically, from God's perspective, two people and he deals with both people here in both of these parables in this verse 44 and then 45 through 46 he deals with the gentiles so we're going to look at these two parables this morning these two parables will describe jesus's love and sacrifice for the jews and the gentiles we see it in paul's letter to the ephesians as he who is a jew writes to the ephesian church which are gentiles and he says this remember that you once gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcised uncircumcision by those or by what is called circumcision made in the flesh and hands. The Jews called the Gentiles uncircumcised. The Jews didn't like the Gentiles. They considered them to be unclean. You didn't sit at the table and eat with a Gentile. Otherwise, you would be defiled from their uncleanliness. And, and they really did have a prejudice against the Gentiles. Um, Paul reminds these Jews that they were called at one time uncircumcised by the circumcised, that is the Jews. And then he says in verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. So Paul is basically saying here that God had called the Jews, but because the Jews rejected it, that is the gospel message, Paul then was called to the Gentiles and God called the Gentiles near to him and they became one basically. Paul was a Jew. He knew the Old Testament. Uh, In fact, he lived in the hope of the Old Testament. And so he saw a problem here of a church being embodied with Jews and with Gentiles. And the problem was that this was Israel's destiny. When you read the whole Old Testament, you know God had chosen this particular people to be his. And every other nation uh, really were, were discarded in a sense because of their wickedness and idolatry and lack of reverence for God. So God chose this people and there was a reason for it because they were the least of all the people that God would pour himself into it and be glorified through this nation. But God made a promise to Israel. And now Paul is saying that the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles and will be God's people, the glory of God's Son and the fullness of the Messiah's glory in this world. So God has chosen Israel as his own special treasure. Remember that God had chosen Israel from all the people of the earth for his own special possession. That's important, his own special possession. And had given promises to these people through Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. Deuteronomy 14.2, Moses reminds the people of Israel, he says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure, a special treasure above all the people who are on the face of the earth. Isaiah we read, said, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. Now Isaiah tells us that Jacob was created by the Lord. Jacob was the son of Abraham, but he says he formed Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel and God began to work in Jacob and created Israel, one who was ruled by God. So it's true what John tells us in chapter three, verse 16. And we all know this verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That includes Jews and Gentiles together. And these two parables 
interestingly enough, deals with those two issues. The first parable deals with Israel being a treasure. The second parable deals with the pearl of great price, which is the Gentile people. And then we see the interpretation. I don't want to give it away too soon, otherwise then you'll get bored and not listen to the rest of the message. So let's go ahead and read verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for the joy over it he goes and sells all that he has to buy that field now only Matthew mentions this parable you won't find it anywhere else this is the first of three final parables that Jesus will instruct his disciples in only the third parable will have an explanation These two parables do not. And so we have to look at them very closely in light of other scriptures to interpret the parables. But I think that as we look at these parables and and read them and think about it for a second, you will agree with me in the interpretation. Jesus continues to teach, of course, on the kingdom of God. And in this parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure, he hides it in a field, and because there's so much joy in his heart, he goes and sells everything that he has to buy the field. So, Jesus uses a very common practice to illustrate the value of treasure here. And really, the value is the treasure itself and how this man sold everything to get the treasure. And so, the treasure is the valuable thing in this parable. The possession of wealth at that time became a source of great stress for people. How would you secure your wealth? How would you keep it from being stolen by thieves that would come in and rob? You would find ways to hide it. They didn't have banks back then where you can go and put in a safety deposit box or devise a plan of concealment of some sort in in some building by a bunch of guards and, and so forth. No, they would find ways to hide their monies, their jewels, their valuables from thieves. And so the more treasure you had, you can only imagine how harder it was to keep your money hidden from anyone else. And so you had to find certain things and ways to conceal these resources sometimes their treasures were hidden in in a secret closet we all tried that right okay let's hide our our little jewels in our closet where would we hide in the closet so nobody could find it right but everyone looks in the closet first if they come to steal things or or we even looked for little storage areas i even thought all oh, the little sockets you know put a little fake socket there you little push a little button the socket pops out you put some little uh, little jewelry inside the socket and we come up with all these little ideas and sometimes the owners would die having hidden their treasures and now no one knows where their treasures are i watched a documentary on a uh, piece of land in britain and this guy was uh, uh turning his dirt over and as he turned the dirt over he found this uh this little box and he opened up the box and it was treasure and it was from the time of the vikings and so he started uh excavating all of his land and he found several spots where there were buried treasure during the viking days so apparently this is something that they all did you know they would go to war they would fight their battles they would get the booty and the treasure they'd keep it well they didn't have banks to put it in so they go to a spot you know and bury it in the ground then you draw a little map with the next and so thus you have treasure maps that they would make up our reference here we find in the old testament also You remember that uh, Joshua came in and conquered the land, Ai, but God says, don't take any of the treasure, leave it all there. But it was Achan who went and took the treasure. What did he do? He hid it in a hole under his tent, hoping that nobody would know. Of course, the Lord knew and he was judged for not being obedient to the Lord. So it was something that they did at that time. And so the Jews understood it completely how valuable treasure was and you had to hide it from thieves and so you would bury it in the ground and in this parable of the talents of the servants you remember the servants who who had to uh uh were given certain amounts of talents and then they had to give a return to the lord of those talents and some gave five some gave less and then there was one that it says he buried it in the earth and then when the lord came he unburied it and he gave it to the lord well he was an unfaithful servant because he buried it in the earth You know, the Lord commands us to be faithful with our resources to him. He doesn't give us resources just to consume for ourselves. He wants us to have a return for his kingdom, really. 
Now, if this man discovers the place where the treasure is hidden, he keeps it for himself. And he finds it just as I shared with you that man in Britain. It's his property. He owns it. He found the treasure. It's his. And so he has the value of that treasure. In this parable, though, this man finds a treasure. He hides it in that field. Then he goes away and he takes everything he owns. He sells it so he can go back and purchase that field where the treasure that he hid in there that he had found. So that's how valuable the treasure is. So as we look at this parable here, we find a few things. Because you might have heard this parable taught this way, that the treasure is in the field is Jesus. The treasure is Jesus. And we are the men, that is the church or the believers. And like the man who found the treasure, when you discover Jesus, you should forsake everything and follow him. That's one interpretation that you may have Um, heard before i have a problem with that how many people really sell everything to follow jesus not too many not too many no it's jesus who has found us and sold everything see i disagree with that interpretation i don't think it's a proper interpretation the man does not represent the believer the believer is unfaithful uncommitted he is not willing to sell everything even when jesus went to the rich man and said sell everything that you have and follow me and he says "Ooh, can't do that that's a lot you're asking of me. You know, and of course, Jesus walked away sad. No, I believe that the treasure is the Jewish people. And I believe that Jesus is that man. And I believe that Jesus went and he sold everything that he had to purchase Israel. Everything. It is the work of Jesus Christ alone on the cross that has the power to purchase Exodus 19 5 says if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine the Lord says wow sounds like an interpretation of that parable Israel he's speaking to here if you'll keep my commandments you are a special treasure to me because the whole earth is mine the field is mine Psalms 135.4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his special treasure. Psalms 135.4, so it seems like in the Old Testament, Israel was known as the treasure. Israel was valuable to the Lord and how the Lord loved the treasure, how the Lord protected the treasure, how the Lord gave promises to the treasure and has been fulfilling his promises to that treasure. He loved that treasure that was buried in the world. And Israel really is scattered in the world today, is it not? Uh, They're all over the world. Many of them are returning to Israel, but many of them are still in the world. In fact, many of them don't even want to go back to Israel. They love the fact that they are in the world and then enjoying the prosperity of the world. And God has blessed them in this world. But God is not through with the nation of Israel. There's still work that he will be doing. And we see that in the book of Romans chapter 11. Paul is very clear to us as he wrote, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite. Now this is Paul speaking from his Jewish heritage. And obviously through, through him speaking here to the Romans, he's presenting himself as evidence that God's not through with the Jewish people because he's Jewish. And if God had been through with the Jewish people, then God would never have saved Paul to preach to the Gentiles. He would have done it another way. So he's saying, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. And God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. So God's not done The evidence is clear. Zechariah says, I will pour on the house of David, on the inhabitations of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they've pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for his firstborn. Though they may deny that Jesus is the Messiah today, one day, Zechariah said, that they will look at Jesus and they will see his hands pierced and then they will acknowledge him as the messiah god's not done with israel yet he loves them so much he still has a plan and a purpose this will take place by the way during the tribulation period when god will deal with the nation israel again zacharias 
writes about that cleansing that will take place during the tribulation period. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. And so the Lord will cleanse Israel once again, reestablish them, and the Lord will create a new heavens and a new earth, and Israel will be a part of that new heaven and new earth. God loves Israel so much, it, they bring so much joy to him. So much joy to him. In fact, for the joy over it, he goes and sells everything there. One commentator interpreted this, for the joy it gives him. It's a little different, isn't it? The joy it gives him. There's certain things that give us joy, right? I mean, our children give us joy when we watch them uh, as godly children. <laughs> you know, uh, things that bring joy to our hearts. God looked at Israel and it brought joy to him. When we read the Old Testament, we see how much joy Israel brought to God. There was a time when they lost the word of God. They had lost Jerusalem, the temple of God, and the people were pretty much scattered throughout. But God was able to bring them back together, and Nehemiah was instrumental in reestablishing the nation Israel again. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 through 10, when reading the law to the people, which they all stood and they read the whole, whole law of the, of the Lord, probably the first five books of Moses, and they read it to the people and they all stood there and they were rejoicing and weeping to receiving the law again into their hearts. And this is what Nehemiah said. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, send portions to those who... Nothing is prepared, for this day is a holy day to the Lord. Then he says, do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now we read that scripture in verse, and I've, I've heard it uh, many times from people. It's not saying that our joy is strength. It's saying his joy of Israel is their strength. That's what he's saying there. He's saying the Lord's joy over you should cause you to be strong. He has so much joy from you that he will never let you go. He has so much joy as a child, as a, as a son, that he will be there to protect you and watch over you. He will fulfill his plan. That's the context that is, that's uh, being written there. Not that we get joy of the Lord. It's the joy that God has for us. And he has that for us also. So Jesus' joy is so overwhelming, he sells everything to purchase the field. And today it might be better, today it might be better for us to put our money in a hole than it is in banks, right? Because of what's going on in our economy today. But a lot of people are not trusting banks anymore. But again, the field is the world. The treasure is Jesus. Israel is buried throughout the world. Probably the, the largest population of Jews today is in New York City. Uh, these people are all over the world. And Jesus gave everything he had to purchase Israel so that he can take them home. A powerful message here for the children of Israel, for every Jew that Jesus loves them. He redeemed the world from Satan, who is the God of this age. Satan has a hold of the Jewish people today. And Jesus has come to redeem them. And so Jesus will come to redeem Israel and this world from this world system. And we know the, the God of this world system is Satan. And he is controlling these things that are happening today against Israel. And in fact, we need to look to Israel to see when our redemption draws near. And today they're being attacked greatly. Russia is over there. And they are gaining ground. I believe that it's the... the um, Turkish area or Yemen's who had just fired into our, our, one of our ships and destroyed it. And so we went and fired back and killed, killed several of their men and, and their missile si silos that were shooting these rockets. So this stuff is heating up. Putin is saying that America needs to be careful. They're weak. Uh, stuff is happening in Israel today. And, and the Russians want Israel. They want the wealth of Israel. They want the land of Israel. And they're going to do whatever it takes. God's not done yet. And there's a great work that's happening over there right now. Now we have the parable of the pearl. Let's read verse 45 through 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Who? 
when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. So again, Matthew is the only one that mentions this parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is, is the topic. And we see a wealthy merchant who is seeking to purchase pearls, but he finds a great pearl, and he goes and sells everything that he has to purchase this pearl. A merchant is one who buys and sells. Usually he'll go to one location and he'll get the best deal because he has the eye, the wisdom, the understanding of its value, and then he'll take it to another location and sell it at a greater price. That's how he does things. He's an effective merchant. He's shrewd in his eyes and his values. And this merchant is spending and studying and examining pearls. And he finds a great pearl, a great pearl of great price. Now the Jews really didn't value pearls. To them, pearls were nothing. I think it was Job that said that pearls are like coral in the sea. It was the Gentiles who valued the pearls. To them, they were valued very highly. They wanted those pearls. They'd exchange those pearls for a lot. Well, what's a pearl? We know that a pearl begins uh, nothing more than a grain of sand that gets into a oyster shell of some sort, whether small or big. And that little grain of sand irritates that little oyster and it begins to give out its little uh, mucus crystalline and surrounds that thing, that irritant, until it creates a smooth little surface and it just does that continually because that little grain should not be there. And then he does it until someone either removes it or it spits it out somehow. They say that if you allow a grain of sand to stay in an oyster for seven years, you'll probably get one of the biggest and, and most valuable oyster. And that's what this man was looking for, were pearls that were at least seven years and that had great value. Now, in this parable, Jesus is the buyer and the individual is the believer. He is the pearl of great price. And Jesus sees that pearl and he goes and he sells everything that he has for the pearl. The last parable of the treasures represented Israel. So this parable here of the pearl represents the Gentiles. And so Jesus is speaking to us Gentiles. We're the irritant. We, we are that little grain of sand. Uh, the Jews didn't like us. Uh, they considered Gentiles barbaric. They had no morals, no values, uh, no understanding of right or wrongs. They pretty much lived uh, on their emotions, feelings, kind of like our nation today pretty much doing what was right in their own eyes. But the Jewish people, they had the law of God and they tried to live to it as best as they could. And this law governed them and protect them and bless them because they were God's chosen people. And, and rightly so, if you were to consider and look at it logically, I mean, they had the law of God and God was leading and guiding them. They may have misunderstood the law and the purpose of the law, but they were trying to live under that law where the Gentiles had nothing. They were barbaric. They pretty much lived the way that they wanted to live. I mean, everything that's happening in our nation today is exactly what has happened in the Roman Empire. Homosexuality, thievery, political anarchists, uh, you know, philosophies and thoughts, agendas and so forth. Exactly the same thing. We have not learned. And in fact, if anything, you look at our nation and apparently we're, we're so good by our society and culture and, and our teachers have told us we're so good, we're evolving to be better. But look at us, are we evolving better? Not when you have two candidates up there throwing words at each other like children. That's not evolving better. How is that better? The lying, the cheating, the stealing, the murdering that's going on in our government today. I don't know if I can get in trouble for that. But those are accusations that are out there. This is our government. This is our world. This is what is getting better, really. African Americans valuing their lives over all other lives. Indians who, who hate Americans. I don't know if you saw the latest little video on that. And they interviewed Indians. What do you think of Columbus Day? Evil, pure evil, they said. What do you think of Columbus Day? the first terrorists on this nation. What do you think of Columbus Day? Hatred, bigotry. You know, this is their view of Columbus Day. And this is what our government is, is really stirring up in our nation is to divide it. And you have to ask yourself, why? I think there's a bigger plan. Uh, they want globalization. 
They want to remove God. They want to remove America. They want one nation. Now, you know what my take on it? Because I have to go back to that whole Indian thing. Here's my take on it, and I think we need to understand this because you can fall into this trap and say, well, yeah, this was their land. You know, they lived here. In fact, uh, one of them said, well, we weren't even, we didn't have a name. They called us Indian because they thought they were in India. So we were named Indian. So that's where our names come from, which really isn't our names. We had our tribes. Here's my take on it. It's just my personal take. You can toss it out afterwards, you know, if you want, whatever. But I believe God's heart, as it was for the Jewish people, is also for the pearl, for the Gentile nations. In America, I didn't have God in the past. They were savages. They weren't savages in the sense maybe, you know, what we would define, but they were killing one another. They were enslaving one another, just like in Africa and other, other places. They were living without God. And so God planted a seed in America to preach the gospel message. And so the gospel went out. And the pilgrims that did come here were Christians that want, wanted to truly worship God freely. And they invited the Indians to participate. They shared with the Indians. They never forced upon the Indians. And if you do your history, you will find that there were very loving, caring Christians that just wanted to worship the Lord. And the gospel came to America. And the gospel spread in America. Yeah, did all this other stuff happen? Of course. America is not perfect. People are not perfect. Let me give you an example. Look at the church itself. Is the church perfect? It's supposed to preach the gospel. We're supposed to love one another. But look at all the fighting and bickering that happens in churches. Because it's filled with secular people. People that are tied to the culture and so forth. So my take is that God is trying to reach people with the gospel. These Gentile people. And that's why Columbus accidentally, you know, one of the Indians said he didn't discover it. He bumped into it accidentally. You know, they, they have a hatred for, for Americans unfortunately, they don't realize that without Jesus Christ, there is no eternal salvation. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can get to the Father except through me, John fourteen six, very clear. And so he brought the gospel here. Jesus loves the Gentiles. And so this parable of the pearls is dealing with the Gentiles. Listen to what Paul said. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Israel was righteous because of the law of, of God. God had given them the Ten Commandments and as long as they continued to sacrifice and offerings, they were considered righteous. We're righteous as Gentiles because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He imputed his righteousness to us. You are the pearl of great price here in this parable, all of us here. You have been clothed with Jesus' righteousness and his righteousness is a thing of matchless beauty, an amazing gift of grace, an unspeakable value in the eyes of God because he loved you. The story of a girl who learned that Jesus was watching over her, everything that she was doing. And her mother asked her, aren't you bothered by this? And the little girl says, no, he loves me so much he can't keep his eyes off of me. And that is so true. That's how much God loves us. Look at verse 46. So when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. So like the merchant who finds a pearl, an outstanding pearl, by the way, who is very wealthy, goes and takes everything that he owns because he knows the value of that pearl. He sells it all and he purchases that deal of a lifetime. And so like that treasure, his merchant sold everything that he had. God sent his only begotten son to seek out men for the kingdom of God, whether Jew or Gentile. He came to this earth so that we could have eternal life. And it's interesting that the pearl to the Jews is not considered valuable and yet to God it was more valuable than anything else in the world including the Jews at that time that he would go to them and the Jews would be laid aside until the day of the tribulation period now let me end with this <clears throat> what did Jesus give up because this merchant sold everything he had to purchase and this is where the love comes in 
And, and we can't deny the love of God for us. In fact, we should never deny it. If you ever feel as though God doesn't love you, push that aside, confess it because it's not true. You just have to look to the cross to see how much God loves you. He loves you so much. I know you are struggling. I know financially. I know maybe in relationships. Whatever your trials are, it's not because God doesn't love you that you're going through them. It is because he does love you and he'll get you through those trials because he loves you very much. He died on the cross for you. The evidence is there, so he has a plan and a purpose for you. Well, what did he give up? You know, some might say that he didn't give up much. You know, he was stuck in a human body for, for a length of time, 33 years while he walked upon this earth. Well, really, not only is he stuck in the body during that time, but he's also stuck in the mortal body that represents that body in heaven because that body still has the pierced hands, uh, pierced side and feet in heaven. As a reminder, the Jews will see it at the tribulation as we saw in the scriptures. And so it's a reminder to us that he gave up a lot C.S. Lewis said in the Christian story, God descends and then rescends. He comes down, down from the heights of absolute being into time and space, if you think about this, down to humanity, down to the very root and seabed of the nature he had created. If you can imagine all of Jesus' glory and unity with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing from eternity, never separated from them at all uh, in this glorious body, and then all of a sudden being separated and coming down and born in the image of a man, that's quite a bit to give up. There was that time when he was on the cross, and he screamed out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he died and he descended into the pit of hell. He was separated from the Father. Now, <clears throat> I think we understand that a little bit with our children. You ever been separated from your child? And you don't know where they're at? And say you go to the mall and all of a sudden you lose them and now you're freaking out, you know? Where did they go? Uh, Simon had done that to us when we were in the mall one time just took off and we were calling his name and he was laughing the whole time I'm sure and we were looking all over the place couldn't find him finally we realized or found him I don't know how but we looked in the middle of the racks of clothes he was sitting inside the middle of it hiding from us but that is a scary feeling to be separated and I think that's just a little bit of what happened with Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit when all of a sudden he was separated He'd been tied to God eternally, forever. And now, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he went into the center of hell to let the captives free. And then ascended to his father again. But wow, what he gave up for us. Here's a few things. His right as God. <clears throat> he was fully God as man. But yet he gave up his right, his his authority in a sense he was totally dependent on the father he had to hear from the father and be directed in where to go and so he gave up a certain amount of his deity his authority his attributes so he couldn't defend himself he couldn't do certain things he didn't allow himself so that he could fully experience what we experience as human beings and so that's why hebrew says that we have a high priest who understands our infirmities and our trials because he's been tempted and tried in every way. And so if you have feelings of abandonment, he totally knows what that means. If you have feelings of being lost and insecure, he knows what that means. Of pain and suffering in your body, he knows what that means. He suffered all those things. If you have those feelings that someone just doesn't love you, doesn't want to be with you, that wants nothing to do with you, that could leave you in a moment, Jesus totally gets that. Totally. He understands what he gave up. Listen to Philippians 2, 5 through 7. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the nature of God did not consider it, consider equality with God something to be grasped. <clears throat> I mean, we just can't grasped uh, the trinity you just can't grasp it nobody can grasp it theologians can't grasp it but we know that it's taught in scriptures it's nothing that can be grasped paul said but he made himself nothing 
taking the very nature of a servant. The word nothing there means what he was, what he was to be nothing. So whatever it is that he was to become nothing, that's a sacrifice. I don't know if we can even describe that. If we can imagine having everything in this world and then all of a sudden having nothing, that's a big jump from having a, the security of a home, of maids, uh, bills paid, not worried about things, uh, you know, all life's pleasures and so forth. And then all of a sudden now you've got not even a house. You're living in a car and the car doesn't even run. And now you're trying to find a job. That's nothing. And that's what Jesus gave up for the treasure and the pearl. Second Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, through, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. And not rich in the sense of materialism, but rich in what is really rich in heaven. Because we know Revelation says that, that the streets of heaven will be paved with gold. <laughs> That's not valuable at all in heaven. So whatever is rich in the presence of God, the glory of God and all his majesty, he left it all to become poor for us, Paul said. Luke 2.51 says, Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. Remember when Jesus... Uh, not run away but was busy about his father's business in the temple teaching the people and it says that Jesus increased in wisdom and statue and in favor of God and men so increasing in wisdom and in statute means that you lost something when he was born into this world and God began to teach him as he began to mature in this world uh, there are several's that have suggested all kinds of different things that he gave up um, whether they're true or not you know uh, uh, his abandonment of certain divine modes his exist his, uh, of existence in order to assume human form him uh, his omniscience his omnipresence you know he gave up the fact that he can't be in one place at one time like he used to be able to be his surrender of eternal physical attributes of omniscience through retaining the attributes of love and truth. This was uh, held by several theologians. He disguised his deity and attributes, not by giving them up, but by living, limiting them to a time form appropriate to human modes of his ex existence. His attributes could only be expressed in relations to the human time and space uh, that is human from that, that a human could experience. Theologians believe that. Uh, he gave up his independence his exercise of those divine attributes and, and i'm sure there is so much more that we could not even understand that he gave up for us so what does that say that tells us how much he loves us and this is a message of love that he loved you the pearl even though we're air tense at times he still loves us he'll never forsake you he begun a good work in you and he is faithful to complete it. And he wants you to have rest in that. Don't doubt his love for you. It is great. And he sold it all to purchase you, the pearl of great price. And by the way, <clears throat> I've heard this many times. And the first time I heard it, it blew me away. If you were the only one on this earth, he would still sell everything for you. That's how much he loves you. And you'd have to be the one to crucify him on the cross. So that's great love. Don't ever forget it. 